All right, everyone. Uh, we have Dr. Johnson again. Um, if you haven't heard his previous lectures, he's given uh, topics including interventional oncology uh, and even device uh, development in the field of IR. Um, so today he'll be speaking about uh, pain and pain management specifically and kind of the advancements and um, things that IR has been uh, you know, specialized in and, and future direction. So um, I'll give him the floor. All right. As he said, I'm Tor Johnson. I do do a significant component of pain as a part of my practice. Um, you'll find that this is variable in some parts of the country. There are some places that do tons and tons of pain, and there's some programs that don't do any. Um, I think that's probably something that will change in the future because there's a lot of things about IR that specifically sort of put us in the right place um, to do this kind of work, and it can be very good. And I would I don't know about your Hippocratic Oath here in Charleston. I couldn't find it online, but basically the one that we took wh where I went to medical school at Indiana, there was a, a part of the oath that actually stuck in my brain um, that we as doctors were to treat disease and relieve suffering. And I feel like, you know, in general, in modern medicine, we do a pretty good job of the treating disease part of this. But um, I think we're actually doing a terrible job and haven't really improved all that much at the relieving suffering part of our job. And so I do think that this is an incredibly important thing to do. And so that's kind of why I want to talk to you a little bit about it. So what is pain? What is pain, right? Um, it's a physical sensation, we would all say, but there's a lot more to it than that, right? So, you know, 60% uh, of patients with depression have or have chronic pain, right? And if you look at patients with chronic pain, they're actually more likely to have depression. And we actually even know the mechanism of this. It's because the periaqueductal gray in the brain that actually signals to turn off pain signals is uh, they signal via serotonin and norepinephrine. And so you, you have to sort of include that as part of, of what you think about in the context of pain. But pain is also about who's supporting you. You know, um, they've done standardized pain experiments where they put a specific amount of capsation on a patient's arm, or they put a specific amount of, uh, they put a specific electric pulse, or they use a specific amount of cold. And patients who are holding the hands of somebody that they love actually report less pain than a person who uh, does not have a person holding their hand. And they, they'll compare the same person against themselves and they'll report less pain when they're holding the hands of someone that they love. There's also concepts of central sensitization. You know, you have pain long enough and all of a sudden you're susceptible to more pain. And if you take too many opioids, that actually makes you even more likely to have pain and you can have pain in, in distributions that aren't consistent with any pathologic stimuli because you hypersensitize the brain. And so that's another component of pain. And then stress can act. People who are stressed out, people who have lots of life stress actually don't um, do as well when they have pain. People who injure their back and are less stressed out get back to work quicker than people who have more stress in their life. And this is all in prospective studies. And then there's also the, the issue of coping skills. People who catastrophize, they look at the world in a very negative way or they um, uh, see the glass sort of half empty all the time, they actually have more pain than people who don't. And this is sort of true across all studies that have been looked at. And then there's also issues of adaptation. You know, you adapt to particular things in your life that are negative, uh, you have a bad back, and so you sort of you adjust how you walk, and that ends up giving you terrible paraspinous muscle pain because your body's not designed to walk like that. And so then you also have issues of mindfulness. Believe it or not, some of the best data for chronic low back pain is actually using cognitive-based mindfulness therapy to actually treat this. And, you know, the placebo effect, um, you know, I know you all know that there is a placebo effect, and that's why we always do these studies that are sort of double-blinded, and you always check it against a placebo. But it turns out in the area of pain, placebo is way, way more powerful than it is anywhere else. You know, the placebo effect accounts for 10% of the improvement in a typical clinical study. It accounts for 30% in pain studies. And believe it or not, also, uh, whether you like your doctor or not, um, is really important in pain. And so this is an incredibly complex area. And it would be really great if some of you that are smart and like complex problems would sort of incorporate this as a component of your career. Because really this is an area that we do terrible in medicine. And so um, you may be asking yourself, well, 
so there aren't there other doctors who work in pain? I feel like I've seen other practitioners who do pain stuff. And, um, you know, it's not IR that I hear about doing this. And that's absolutely true. There are anesthesia pain doctors. There are pain medicine and re- PM&R, pain me- medicine and rehabilitation doctors. Neurosurgery does some pain stuff, especially stimulators, sometimes kyphoplasty, sometimes those sorts of things. Neurology does a whole bunch in pain. Um, often in, in terms of like movement disorder clinics and patients with spinal cord injuries and that sort of thing, orthopedics does a lot in pain. And, you know, you've also got neuroradiology and MSK radiology. So why, where's the place for IR and all this? That's a question that you might ask, but I would argue that there's probably a really important place for IR, because if you look at this list of doctors that we have listed here, um, how many of those are real experts in image and image gu- imaging and image guidance? Oh, and palliative care, I left them off, sorry. Sometimes they do a lot in pain, often not interventional, but they do a lot in pain as well. So yes, why interventional radiology? And if you look at the ones that are experts in Im- imaging, you're eliminating a whole bunch of these. You can say, oh, well, neurosurgery is an expert at imaging of the brain, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're they have the same skill set when it comes to fluoroscopic guidance and they don't have the imaging equipment that we have. And so you'd say, oh, yeah, NeuroRads and MSK, they're definitely as good at imaging as I are. However, they're not experts at patient care by and large. They're they're more in a diagnostic mentality than a procedural mentality. IR does 1,600, 1,700 procedures a year, and every single one of them is image guided. And so there really isn't anybody who combines both the expertise in terms of image guidance and ability to appropriately position fluoroscopy and CT and ultrasound and MRI in conjunction with excellent patient care. And so that's why it's a little surprising to me, to be perfectly frank, that there isn't a, a much, much larger role of IR in pain management currently in the country. And then the other thing I have that a pain management doctor does not have is I have a CT scanner. Um, and that makes me better at a lot of stuff because, you know, you take a block like a trigeminal block and that looks really scary, right? You're jamming a needle in the side of this patient's face down deep into the middle of their skull. Who who the heck knows where you're putting it? And you just have to hope that you put it in the right spot. That's a very dangerous and scary looking uh, block for a, for a pain doctor. But on a CT scanner, I can see exactly what I'm crossing. I can see exactly where I'm putting my needle because I have three-dimensional information and it becomes easy sauce to do this kind of block using a CT scanner. And so that's another inherent advantage that we have. And while we're on the discussion of, you know, primarily PM&R and um, pain management, those are specialties that primarily are outpatient and they don't have the capacity to absorb, um, you know, other extra procedures in the hospital, whereas most of what we do in IR is hospital-based. Now, does that mean I don't do blocks on outpatients? Yeah, absolutely. I do outpatient blocks in the hospital, but I also do them in our clinic out in Mount Pleasant. So, you know, we can still do all the same things that the pain doctors do, but we have the extra component that we have a significant inpatient presence, which helps us to respond acutely to problems, in particular with patients with cancer pain. And so as an outline for what I was gonna talk to you guys today about, I was gonna talk a little bit about the patient selection and I don't have to put a black box over this little lady's face uh, because that's my grandma and so I'm allowed to put her in my presentations. Um, And she has a ton of compression fractures. That's why uh, she's a pictured here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about nerve blocks and I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, vertebral compression fractures and kyphoplasty. I don't have time to talk about absolutely everything. I will tell you, that um, if if I were to describe everything I do did, you, you, you would be surprised at the volume and it doesn't fit in an hour for sure. So who gets, so when we're talking about patients like my little grandma with her multiple, multiple compression fractures, unfortunately that she had before I was a doctor who fixed compression fractures, um, there are some modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for this, right? Age greater than 55, gender, race, history of fractures in adulthood, history of compression fractures in first degree relatives, dementia and susceptibility to fall. And then there are modifiable ones in in terms of osteoporosis, smoking, alcohol, inadequate physical activity, and those sorts of things. And you you may be asking, well, why does smoking cause 
um, compression fractures. That doesn't seem to make any sense. But it turns out that smokers all end up with poor bone density for a couple reasons. Uh, they tend to have poor nutrition, but then also all of them are low activity, which makes your bones softer, and they get put on steroids for their COPD, which also makes your bones softer. And so there, there are uh, significant risk factors, and these are patients that we see a ton here in South Carolina, just because of obesity and tobacco use and that sort of thing. In addition, um, you know, this is a huge problem that's sort of under dealt with at this point in history. There are 700,000 compression fractures per year in the US. 16% uh, of men over 50 have a compression fracture, 30% of women over 50. 50% uh, of women and 20% of men lifetime will get a compression fracture. Men and women um, both have age-related increases, but women have more fractures than men. And less than 5% of these are in patients younger than 60. And 11% in those age uh, 70 to 79 years of age, 18% in those eight, 80 years older or older. And so you're talking about 2,000 osteoporotic compression fractures in 2005 based on Medicare database, 3 million fractures by 2025, which is an increase of 52%. And it's because our population is aging and um, uh, you know, we're also being able to keep people alive. So the overall population is aging, plus the average patient is getting older. And so this is a problem that's going to continue to grow over the next several years. And to be honest, this is likely an underestimate as one third of fractures are diagnosed uh, as acute fractures. So if you look at the total number of patients with compression fractures versus those diagnosed with acute compression fractures, only about one third of them are actually being diagnosed. And then the other group of patients that I wanted to talk to are pain patients. And again, I would say we have here a population that's horribly underserved by medicine in general, in particular when you're talking about cancer pain. You know, there's lots of pain doctors who run clinics and you, you can go to, you know, Spine Center of South Carolina and Mount Pleasant or wherever you want to go. They'll get you your MRI. They'll get your, your block on the same day. They'll have an orthopedic surgeon see you because you know, there's kind of big money in that. But cancer pain is actually sort of the redheaded stepchild of the world because those patients re require too much work in some cases. And if you actually look at our population of cancer patients, and this is over the course of three or four different studies, which I looked up um, recently, presently in the United States, 30% of cancer patients are undertreated for pain. Um, medical management has gotten better, but primarily we're still using the same things we were using 20 years ago. You know, fentanyl lollipops and transdermal fentanyl is much more advanced than morphine, but it's basically the same mechanism. And those have limitations that can't be overcome just by getting fancier and fancier opioids because the opioids still all work in the same way. Cancer pain can be either neuropathic or inflammatory pain. Um, you should really consider all cancers to be inflammatory because in all cases, unless you're, you know, horribly immunosuppressed, your body's actually attacking the cancer. And so that causes inflammation because there's dead cancer cells and there's dead immune cells and inflammation equals pain. And then neuropathic can be either from direct invasion of nerves or cancers pressing on nerves or just being next to nerves because that inflammation can cause neuropathic pain as well. And the other thing that we often see in the cancer patients is chronic pain is the sequelae of treatment. So we cure your cancer, but now you've got uterine necrosis from your pelvic radiation that's making your life totally miserable. So your pain, your cancer's gone, but that doesn't change the fact that you're struggling to just get through the day because of your pain. And then the other issue that we're running into a lot in the cancer pain population specifically is that we're keeping patients alive. We're getting better at treating cancer. And so there's a lot of patients who are alive a lot longer and those patients are hurting more because they've gone through more lines of treatment before they actually succumb to their disease. And to be honest, this increase in understanding of cancer pain and increase in understanding of mechanisms of pain in general has not led to significant changes in practice. So this is something we're getting better at understanding, but it hasn't changed the way that we fundamentally practice medicine. And that's why I think that there's a real strong role for IR in this area in particular. So 70% of all cancer patients have pain. 
Um, and if you look at um, the patients who still have pain after their cancer is cured, it was 33% in 2007, it's 39% in 2016. So this is a population that's growing. And advanced stage cancer, 64% um, had pain in 2017 that's uncontrolled and 66 had pain that's uncontrolled in 2016. Most common cancer with pain is actually head and neck cancer. Those are the ones that hurt the worst, um, just you know, for purposes of you know, being interesting. And patients with cancer pain, the thing that a lot of people forget is they're still going to have degenerative back disease and they can still have diabetic peripheral neuropathy and they can still have all the other issues that they would have had if they didn't have cancer. And so you really have to think about all of those things when you're talking about treating this population. And that's kind of where we come in. Yes, opioids are great. And there's a reason that um, cancer patients in the U.S. live longer, and it's not just because we have chemos that other countries don't have. It's also that we have better access to pain medicines. And so developing nations have a lot of deaths that are related to uncontrolled pain, and getting good control of pain positively improves your survival. It's not just, you know, something that's good in terms of making the patients happier. It actually su improves survival. And it turns out you can block almost any peripheral uh, nerve uh, temporarily, and then many of them you can actually ablate and still leave the patient functional and get rid of their pain. So this is a complete list of all of the nerve blocks that are possible to perform in um, interventional radiology. And again, some of these are incredibly scary if you happen to be a pain doctor. Um, but super easy if you happen to be an IR doctor who has a CT scanner, like Atlanto occipital blocks and Atlanto axial blocks. Those are really scary because you know you're worried that you're going to stab the cord, but not if you have a CT scanner. And so a lot of these can be very easily done and are very good for patients. And so basically, what we do is we just put a needle down on the nerve root. Um, you have to make sure that before you do this, if it's not a cancer pain patient, you got to document the pain, you got to document the area, you have to uh, fail to respond to four to six weeks of um, conservative therapy, including NSAIDs, PT, chiropractic, acupuncture, rest, blah, blah, blah. And then um, you're allowed to redo blocks if at least 50% pain relief for at least six to eight weeks. And the reason it's 50% pain relief is exactly for the reason that I told you that the placebo effect can account for 30% improvement in pain studies. So it's gotta be better than that. And that's why this is what all the insurance companies do. And um, I don't know if you guys know the visual analog pain scale, but you want it at least six to seven, which is moderate to severe pain in order to be qualified for a nerve block. And they must have PT and OT as a part of their chronic pain regimen if um, you're going to continue to do blocks over and over. We can also do sympathetic blocks, right? You, you guys have all heard about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve system, and you know it's the fight or flight and all that, blah, blah, blah. But the other thing that the sympathetic nerve system controls is a lot of the visceral pain. You have the somatic pain that you feel where somebody stabs you in the arm, but when you get liver pain from kidney stones or kidney pain uh, from kidney stones, or you get liver pain from capsular stretch from a hematoma or an abscess or something, that's actually visceral pain and that's mediated through the sympathetics. And so we can actually block those both in patients with cancer and patients without, in order to get patients relief of their pain. And in, in, in the case of the celiac plexus, you can also actually get them relief of nausea, which can be very helpful for these patients. Complex regional pain syndrome, which I'm sure some of you have symp reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Um, it's, a it's an inappropriate activation of these sympathetic chains that cause significant pain. And so you can actually treat that with these sympathetic blocks. And, you know, in a patient with non-healing ulcers of the foot or non-healing ulcers of the hand, you can improve both the pain by taking out those sympathetics, but also improve the, um, the perfusion because the sympathetics are what are responsible for vasoconstriction. And so if you've got a person with really bad peripheral vascular disease, you can make their pain better and their vascular better, vasculature better by taking out those sympathetics because then you just have unopposed um, parasympathetic um, uh, signal, which actually will um, dilate the blood vessels. So this can be very helpful, not just in terms of the pain from the standpoint of blocking this, the sensation of pain, but also in terms of actually dealing with some of the problems associated with pain. 
So sympathetic blocks of the of the celiac plexus, pancreas cancer, you've all seen that. This is an incredibly underutilized, usually patients are like end stage before people think about this, but it's a great way to decrease pa patient, patient's opioid requirements is to deal with this. And, and it does help with nausea too. So this is a really good thing to help with these patients. And you, you know, it actually works pretty well in chronic pancreatitis as well. Doesn't work in everybody, but it does work in several patients and it definitely works with the nausea. You know, and again, we have pretty well-defined dermatomes to figure out what pain, what nerve root is causing pain at what level. And this is actually a, a, you know, a dermatomal map that shows you where to press at the dots in order to figure out which nerve root is actually the one that's affected. So you can check for pain in these locations and that'll tell you exactly what nerve root it is that you consider to be the one that's the problem. And, you know, it's the backside too, you know, so there you go. In terms of that sympathetic pain that I'm talking about, you know, for the head and neck and the upper arm, you're talking about um, a stellate ganglion, which is up in the neck, but in the abdomen, the chest and the, and the uh, pelvis, you, we actually know the ganglions that we have to block or we have to ablate in order to treat this, right? So the sympathetic chain for chest pain or you know, the, uh, the uh, lower spinal cord into the celiac plexus, you know, the, all of the visceral pain associated with the stomach, the small intestines, the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, the kidneys, you can deal with all that pain by blocking this or ablating it because you can ablate the celiac plexus with impunity. And basically what you get is two weeks of diarrhea, and then um, which can actually be a comfort in some of these patients because some of them are so constipated from all the opioids. But then after that, that kind of evens out and you've taken care of a lot of their pain. So this is really underutilized, but actually very helpful. And then the hypogastric plexus is actually the, the plexus that sits right on top of the, of the sacrum. And that actually mediates a lot of pain from the lower uh, um, you know, abdomen and also the urinary bladder in the female and male genital or uh, um, reproductive organs. And so this is, again, this is one you actually have to block before you can ablate it. The celiac plexus, you can ablate with impunity. The hypogastric plexus sometimes people have some portion of their continence that's going through the hypogastric plexus. So you always have to block it first to make sure you're not gonna make them incontinent before you can ablate it. But again, it's ablatable in almost everybody. And this can cause a huge relief, especially for patients with like pelvic radiation and that sort of thing. This is that stellate ganglion that I talked about. Reflex sympathetic dystrophy, which is the other name for a complex regional pain syndrome, vascular insufficiency in the upper extremity, trigeminal neuralgia, in particular shingles, has a tendency to, to have a significant sympathetic component when they have trigeminal neuralgia related to single or shingles. And then Renaud's phenomenon in the hand, because again, it'll dilate those blood vessels, which will help with perfusion, but also help with pain. And then sympathetically mediated cancer pain can also be affected here as well as vascular headaches. And it's pretty easy for us. You just gotta go at the level of C6. And you know, we, we puncture here all the time in order to get into the, the, um, the jugular vein, which is compressed in this particular picture. It's kind of sitting on top of the carotid artery, which you're seeing there, but we can actually see the stellate ganglion at this level and we can block it and you can actually ablate this ganglion too. The only thing that you'll get if you ablate the stellate ganglion is you will get ptosis of the eyelid and you will get sort of dilation of the, of the um, you'll, you'll get sort of dilation of the, um, uh, of the uh, eye, which, you know, some people can tolerate if you can get rid of their upper extremity pain or their head and neck pain. There's also blocks that we can do at the pelvic floor. Pelvic floor pain is one of the worst um, complications for women, especially who've gotten mesh for a pelvic floor reconstruction. And that pain tends to be unrelenting and it's very difficult to treat. However, you can do a pudendal block and they are comfortable. Some of them you do a pudendal block every three months and then they go away, they live comfortably for three months, they come back. Um, some of them you do an ablation. Uh, I tend to do more ablations for women than men because men um, have a hard time getting an erection if you if you uh, ablate their pudendal nerve. But you know, if you have penile cancer, that may not be the worst thing in the entire world. 
But and they then you get six months because it does eventually grow back. But you'll get about six months where you don't have to come see me, where you just are living your life and being comfortable. And then when the pain starts to come back, they come back. And so I have patients like this who go away for six months, then come back, then go away again for six months. And it can be an incredible um, increase in their quality of life when you do this sort of thing. And again, if you have a CT scanner, super, super easy. All I got to do is drive the needles in on the on the edge of the pelvis there, and I can block it or I can ablate it. And it's actually quite easy, as you can see in these two pictures. Whereas if you're doing this fluoroscopically, you technically are supposed to stick your finger in the rectum, uh, palpate the bone there, and then drive a needle towards your finger, which is, homie, don't play that. You got to pay extra for that. And I'm not poking toward my finger with a needle ever, especially not while inside somebody's rectum. And so this is a super easy block for us to do, but a little bit harder if you happen to be a pain doctor out in practice in the world without a CT scanner. And so if it's if there's a benign condition, then we, we'll tend to do steroids or ablation. If it's malignant, we'll do ablation and it is totally repeatable. You can also get a peripheral stimulator for this and that's something we can also do for you if you need us to. Caudal epidural nerve block. You've heard about epidural nerve blocks. This is actually super, super easy. And for sacral pain and uh, you know hip pain, this can be very, very helpful for people. And so it can be an incredible um, Im improvement in their quality of life. And then um, this is the actual, one of the most under-recognized and over-diagnosed conditions that we do is called piriformis syndrome. The piriformis is a support muscle of the pelvis and this can get inflamed. And when it does, it actually pushes on the sciatic nerve and it can cause a ton of pain going down the leg. And it also makes it very painful to lift your leg high. So like going upstairs and that sort of thing. And again, super easy to treat with an ultrasound probe. I can stick a needle into that into that piriformis muscle, and then I can put steroids in there and it gets better. Intercostal blocks, this is probably one of the most common blocks that I actually do. And this is for people with uh, intercostal neuralgia. You know, it turns out that if you've if you've been operated on, you've had a thoracotomy, 30, 30 to 50% of post-thoracotomy patients have permanent pain and you can block or ablate, 60 to 75% will get complete relief from treating this. So this is a really important thing to recognize and to be able to do. And we do it better than others because we're good at ultrasound. You can also do it with fluoroscopy, which is the picture I'm showing you here. I don't have a tendency to do this, but you can if you want to, because it's so easy with ultrasound, there's no reason to do this. But you can also ablate this. So we have radio frequency ablation probes, we have cryoprobes, and we have ethanol, which allows us to ablate these. There's a limited motor component. You will get a little bit of the transversus abdominis muscles, so they'll feel like their belly's pooching out a little bit. But aside from that, patients don't get a lot of um, uh, sort of problems associated with these kind of blocks. And so you can block it and you can ablate it. And again, this is one of those ones where you ablate it, they come back six months later, you ablate it again, they come back six months later, you ablate it again. Facial nerve, totally blockable or ablatable. And again, the, the key is you just have to be careful and let patients know that they're gonna be numb if you ablate this. If you block it, they won't be, but you know, this is these are all blocks that we can do very easily. And you know, again, this is a super scary area to go into if you happen to not have a CT scanner, which I do, but all of these are super easy to block if you um, have a CT scanner. And basically we have a tendency to use these with steroids, often a depot pr uh, preparation like methylprednisolone because um, then you can get long-term effects. And you know, if you look at nerve blocks in general, most patients still have benefit nine months later. And we always mix that with anesthetic because um, what you can do is you can A, it tells you, um, uh, so if I were to ablate this nerve, what kind of deficits would they have and what kind of benefit would they get? Because the anesthetic's gonna wear off and it takes the steroids about three days to kick in. And so it gives you kind of a differential so you can decide which of those is actually the mo more helpful part. You wanna consider depot preparations, insoluble versus soluble. In some places, you're a little scared to use insoluble because you can cause embolization as a result of this. And there is a greater possibility for stem systemic effects when you use higher doses and with the soluble um, steroids. Um, so in terms of nerve blocks, just as final notes, all nerves can be temporarily blocked. Some can be ablated without any deficits. Some deficits are worth the ablation. 
if you're non-ambulatory and you're having terrible, terrible sciatic pain and I can ablate your sciatic nerve, yeah, you're going to have foot drop, but if you're not walking, who cares, right? And so it might be worth ablating that nerve in order to give you relief so that you can be sort of cogent and not in a methadone coma you know, with your with your family taking care of you. And then I also want to let you know that if you have questions about any of the, these kinds of things, because this is all very complicated, you are welcome to call my cell phone and ask me questions, okay? So a little bit about back pain, and then I'll, I'll leave some time at the end for you guys to ask some questions if you'd like to. This is a lot, I know. And so I do I, I, I do know I'm kind of dumping a fire hose down your, down your mouth, but I did want to kind of give you a sort of broad overview of the kind of things that we do. So when you talk about back pain and you talk about fractures, this is an area where we can be incredibly helpful. And you know, this is one of my favorite procedures in IR because most of the stuff I do, you know, somebody comes in for their chemoembolization of their liver tumor, they come in, they were feeling okay, I I hit them with this stuff in their liver and they feel pretty bad for a few days and then they get back to normal. This is a procedure where they come in feeling terrible and they walk out on the same day feeling better than they did when they walked in the room. And so that's what an acute compression fracture looks like. And you can kind of tell the difference between the acute, which is the one that's bright on this dark signal. That's a T2 stir, which tells you whether it's acute or not. You can't really fix chronic fractures. So there's really not a huge reason to try. And so um, you, you basically are fracturing it. If it's completely healed, you're fracturing it in order to fix it. And so unless they have bad spinal stenosis and are not surgical candidates, you know, you probably don't want to work on the on the acute fractures. And what we do for this is something called vertebral augmentation. And basically, you want to make sure they're candidates for it. This is uh, the Telix system, um, uh, and I tend to use this. It's actually it's a it's an orthopedic surgery um, scale, but I tend to use it because I feel like you should exist in the ecosystem of the other physicians who actually do the same sorts of things that Sorry. you do. Oh, Siri is just out of control today. Sorry about that. Um, and so I do calculate whether there are candidates for kyphoplasty based on this. And there are three flavors of vertebral augmentation in the United States. One is vertebroplasty, and that's basically where you, you hammer a needle through the pedicle into the vertebral body, and then you fill it up with cement. And what this does is immediately fix the fracture. So it'll go into all the planes of the fracture. And the cement is something called polymethyl methacrylate, which is exactly the same thing that they make um, fiberglass out of. Fiberglass, they shoot it through an extruder. And then that extruder actually, you then take the fibers you make and glue them back together. And that makes very flexible um, uh, but strong uh, 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 material, whereas in this, we are letting it polymerize, so it's super strong and super light, and it's very dark because it's doped with barium. And so basically, there's a fracture, you stick a needle into it, you fill it up with cement, the fracture is gone. Um, and, you know, kyphoplasty is very similar. The only difference between vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty is before you put that cement in, you actually put up a balloon. And that actually does a couple of things. It helps reduce any of these fractures to get you more height restoration. But then what it also does is it gives you a cavity that that cement goes into. So you're less likely to have the cement go someplace you don't want it to. And so you stick the needle through the pedicle, just like we said before. You insert that balloon, you blow up the balloon, you take out the balloon, and then you fill it up with cement. And that kind of fixes the fracture, but also increases the height of the vertebral body. And, you know, you kind of, this is a picture of me doing exactly that. I put the needle in, I drill it out, I put the balloon in, I blow up the balloon, and then I fill it up with cement. And that's what it looks like after you fill it up with cement. And you can see there's actually pretty good height restoration on this, and there's pretty dense cement there. So it looks really, really nice. Spine jack is the other way in which we're capable of uh, fixing these fractures. And spine jack is exactly what it looks like. These are little jacks that you put inside the vertebral body, you jack them open, and then you fill it up with cement there. And so that can actually get you some better height restoration. The, the big trick with this is that you need big, bigger pedicles in order to fit these things in because they're kind of big. And so again, you know, you put the needles in, you put the spine jack out, you open them up the spine jack, 
and then you fill them up with cement and then you're you know that's you restored height and you fixed a fracture and then the the last thing that we we generally do is especially in cancer patients we do a lot of what's called ablation kyphoplasty so you hammer the needles in exactly the same way and then before you put those balloons in you actually put in radio frequency probes and you cook the tumor so that when you fill it up with cement you don't actually spread the tumor around the body and in addition there's actually a nerve cluster in the back of the vertebral body called the basal vertebral ganglion and you cook that too which doesn't cause any problems in terms of the patient from a sensation standpoint or anything, but it does actually um, deal with their pain. That's discogenic back pain is mediated by that um, dors basivertebral ganglion. And so by cooking that, you actually can um, help these patients with their pain, um, especially in the cancer patients. And basically you put the probe in, it's a bipolar RF ablation probe, it cooks the tumor. But the really nice thing about RFA in this context, because, you know, to be Perfectly frank, we have a tendency to use more microwave and cryo than we use RFA because RFA is limited relative to those other modalities in a lot of ways. But this is a place where RFA is really handy because RFA won't burn past the cortical bone. So I'm not worried I'm going to injure the spinal cord. I'm not worried I'm going to injure nerve roots because I can't burn past the cortical bone. And so th this is actually can be very, very helpful in treating these and also dehydrating this tumor and also thrombosing the blood vessels so I don't get cement into the veins when I'm putting it into the vertebral body. And again, here's the kind of thing you see. You got a fracture, it's related to cancer. You put a probe in, you cook it, and then you fill it up with bone cement to stabilize after you cook it. And this is not a small problem, just so you know, uh, based on autopsy series, patients who die of cancer, 36% of them have spinal tumors, and most of those are actually painful. And so, yes, we do do um, radiation for those, and that can be very effective, actually. However, there are some patients that will still fracture after they get radiation, and there's some patients in which the radiation doesn't relieve their pain. And so kyphoplasty is a very important procedure, which, again, is underutilized in this context. And you know, we can do this in the sacrum too. This is actually on label. This is not off label or anything like that. And sacroplasty can be very helpful, particularly in patients who've had cancer who get pelvic radiation, either rectal cancer or um, cancer like um, uterine cancer or cervical cancer, because they get a ton of radiation and it causes fractures. And so if you were to actually prospectively look at every patient who got pelvic radiation and you did it with an MRI so you could actually see what you were looking at, 70% um, of them get sacral insufficiency fractures as a result of their treatment. And not all of them get pain, so we don't fix all of those, but a significant number of them do get pain. And so you can be really helpful in this. And it's super important. This is what it looks like on an MRI. You can see it's T2 bright. Or on a bone scan, you see the sort of Honda sign of increased bone turnover in there. And, um, you know, based on a prospective trial, um, you know, six-month mortality rate was 9.8% for patients with sacral fractures who are not treated and 17.1% um, at one year. And then the risk factors for this are exactly the same as for um, osteoporotic compression fractures, except you add in the pelvic radiation thing that we just talked about. And so more compression fractures in the sacral spine means that you're more susceptible to compression fractures elsewhere too. And this is almost exclusively a female problem, 10 to one women to men. And usually they're not presenting with the same sort of terrible back pain you get with kyphoplasty. They're usually talking about, oh, I'm walking like a duck. My, my gait is too wide. I have vague back pain or difficulty going from uh, laying down to sitting or sitting to standing up. And then um, they may have an inability to walk. And it turns out in a nice prospect, and this is what it looks like. You just hammer those needles in and you fill it up with cement in exactly the same way you do with the kyphoplasty, except I don't use balloons for this myself. In a series of 243 patients um, using the visual analog pain scale, so 9.2 out of 10 um, was the average pain uh, prior to the procedure. And this this particular physician is really, really good at this. So uh, his, his outcomes are actually pretty spectacular. Um, and then following the sacroplasty, this improved to a pain score of two. And if you were to look at patients with kyphoplasty, there are 27 prospective randomized clinical trials. And if you took the average pain 
um, of a patient who enrolled in that trial, it was eight out of 10 right before the procedure. It was four out of 10 um, 30 minutes after the procedure, and it was two out of 10 at one month. And so similar beneficial outcomes when you talk about kyphoplasty. But the thing that I think is also really important to remember is that when you treat pain, you're not just making sure that pe patients feel better, you're actually saving their lives because people die from pain. And you know, when you look at a large population of, of patients who um, you know, uh, get vertebral compression fractures versus those that don't, and most of these are Medicare patients, I told you they're all over the age of 65, most of them are over the age of 70, you know, the, the number needed to treat to save a life um, with kyphoplasty compared to doing conservative management is only 14.8 at one year. And at um, at uh, five years, it's only 11.9. And so uh, just so you're all aware, those are better no numbers than stroke embolectomy. So you're more likely to save somebody's life by doing a kyphoplasty on them than you are by sucking a clot out of their brain. And so, this is actually incredibly important in terms of survival. And you ask, well, why are these patients dying? Okay, so you get a compression fracture, you don't get treated, what do you do? They give you tons of pain medicines, they tell you to lay in bed to rest, they put you in a brace, they tell you not to move around so you don't hurt yourself and that makes your bones soft, that gets you pneumonia, you break your hips, you can have trouble with, you can have DVTs and that sort of thing. So that's kind of the reason that people die from this. And it makes your bones suffer so you're more likely to get a subsequent fracture because moving is very important for keeping your bones hard. And this is a really nice study if any of you are interested in actually looking at, um, uh, you know, a large, so, you know, there's some controversy about kyphoplasty because there have been three of those 27 prospective trials that I told you showed no benefit. However, this is a systematic review of all 27 of them uh, looking at the prospective trials in which um, they evaluated kyphoplasty, which does show that there's significant clinical benefit of kyphoplasty, just so you know. And that's where those numbers that I just gave you, the eight, the four, the two, it comes out of this paper. So this is a really good and important paper in this area. You know, and there's a lot of stuff that I talked about today. I kind of like opened up the fire hose and sprayed you in the face, but you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we do for pain that I just, didn't think I had time for, although as fast as I talked, apparently I did have more time. You know, I do place intrathecal pain pumps, which are uh, subcutaneous pumps that are completely under your skin that are loaded with um, drugs. And then you can put that pain medicine directly on the spinal cord. And so I can get you much better pain relief and less opiate side effects by doing this. We also do a ton of ablations all over the body in soft tissue sometimes and bones sometimes. And that can be very helpful for dealing with pain, not just kyphoplasty, but also like in this context that you see here, this is somebody whose scapula had a met in it that was causing terrible arm and shoulder pain. You put a needle in there, you cook the tumor, and then you fill it up with cement, which actually stabilizes the fracture. And that can actually really, really help with people's pain. And then the other thing that we do an awful lot of in terms of IR in general, and this is every Everybody, not just pain oriented physicians like myself, um, we do a lot of embolizations for pain. So, you know, it can be uh, palliative embolizations for recurrent bleeding from duodenal tumors or from renal cell tumors. But, you know, renal cell carcinoma hurts like crazy. And so embolizing it can actually be helpful. Even if I'm not trying to cure your cancer, I can actually make your pain a lot better. In some of these cases with renal cell bone mets and renal cell, you know, in situ, you can make their pain a lot better by embolizing that even when you're not trying to cure them. And so there's lots and lots and lots of stuff that we're good at in IR and we have the tools that other people don't in order to, to, to treat these pain patients. And it can be incredibly fulfilling. You know, I would say I, I've placed lots and lots of pain pumps, but my two biggest success stories, in fact, I would say my three biggest success stories are all dead. Um, all, all three of them are dead. Um, one was a, you know, 36 year old diabetic with terrible, terrible gastroparesis, which was super, super uncomfortable. So she'd go home, she'd take her opiates, it would cause her gastroparesis to get worse. She'd show up at the hospital with a bowel obstruction and she was basically doing that every two weeks. We put a pain pump in her 
you know, the doses I use are 300 times lower when I'm putting them in a pain pump. And so it didn't affect her gastroparesis. And so she went back to having quality of life. She died of a heart attack. Um, it, nothing to do with the pain pump or diabetes. Well, probably from her diabetes, but she died of a heart attack. But she had two years of incredible good quality life where she wasn't in the hospital every two weeks, which is what she was for the year before we placed the pain pump. Another one of my patients was a patient that had fibromyalgia, polymyalgia rheumatica, and dermatomyositis. So she had lots of reasons for pain, but then developed metastatic breast cancer. And so she was already in pain before she had a cancer diagnosis. And once her, her, her cancer metastasized to her bones, she was just in pain all the time and they couldn't get her out of the hospital. And I put a pain pump in her. And I mean, the doses of medicine that I put her on were just ridiculous. But, you know, she was on 17 mics of zaconitide, which is a med you can only put into a pain pump. And she was on uh, 10 of Dilaudid in a pain pump, which is the equivalent of giving somebody 3,000 of Dilaudid orally. Um, so a lot. And she was walking and she was talking and she was living her life and she died of her cancer. But she actually had quality of life right up until the day that she died. She was not in pain and she was able to go about her life and drive and be a normal human being. And then the third one was a, was a young woman with a terrible, terrible um, uh, cervical cancer, um, 31 years old, eaten into her spine, causing terrible, terrible pain um, from, uh, you know, invasion of the hypogastric plexus. And I put a pain pump in her and she's the kind of patient who would have been in a methadone coma if she hadn't had a pain pump, but she was able to be uh, to play with her kid and uh, interact with her husband until a week before she died. Um, she kind of went downhill after that, but most of those patients would have, you know, and as healthy as she was, it would have been a month of her being a shivering wreck if we hadn't had a pain pump in her because the doses you would have had to use to keep her comfortable would have been well beyond anything we could have done, you know, with, 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 oral medicines and still have her alert. And so, yes, she died, but she had quality of life and she got to spend time with her husband and she got to spend time with her baby. And so, you know, that to me is a victory, even though she ultimately succumbed to her disease. And so that's kind of the reason why I do this sort of, of thing, because we in IR see tons and tons and tons of these oncology patients. But, um, Nobody else is necessarily taking care of them the way that we do. And they come into the hospital all the time and they need somebody who's in the hospital and can see them. And this can be an incredibly um, rewarding area of your career if you're willing to deal with how complex and difficult um, pain can be in terms of uh, the management of these patients. And so with that, uh, I talked incredibly fast. I apologize, it's been a very long day. I was working really, really hard. Um, and so I may have just gotten talky fasty because I was dealing with patients all day and um, trying to multitask. But if with that, I'll take any of the questions that you'd like to ask. Yeah, I got um, two questions. Um, one relates to um, more of, um, management of like vertebral bone mets. So you kind of mentioned how you can use RFA. Um, plus a kyphoplasty. Um, how does that kind of play in your management when, you know, as a student sometimes, especially on question banks, you're kind of told that external beam radiation is usually the palliative measure, um, but also, you know, um, can help uh, with symptoms and stuff like that. So in your use, do you combine it? Do you think it could be a totally different adjunctive therapy um, with external beam radiation? How do you view that? So the problem with bone mets is if you have a couple, you often have a lot, right? And so um, the thing is, if they've got mets up and down the spine, I'm not going to fix that because I'm not doing kyphoplasty to every single level. And so it's really appropriate to use radiation. And, you know, in South Carolina, because we didn't expand under the Affordable Care Act, physicians are put under a lot of pressure to be productive in terms of our clinical practice. I'm not, but everybody else is because I, I have way more patients than I can possibly deal with. But um, so there is that sort of sense of competition. But um, I came here, we weren't really doing 
doing this, but you know, palliative the the radiation oncologists were doing lots and lots of radiation to the spine, but they get frustrated too because 30% of the of the bone mets that they irradiate subsequently fracture. And it doesn't matter if you've killed the cancer if the bone's fractured, because that's still gonna hurt. And so we do this a lot in conjunction with each other. There's patient, you know, I, I can show you my email. I'll show you an email from Dr. Rivers. Where does she go? Where does she go? She emailed me like an hour ago um, talking about um, a pain patient, a, a patient who she thinks needs a kyphoplasty. Do you know what I mean? So, and that's coming from Charlotte Rivers, who is one of the radiation oncologists. And so you'd think, oh, well, yeah, so people are going to do radiation or they're going to do kypho. No, that, you know, it's the same thing doesn't work for everybody. Fractures still need to be fixed, even if you treat with radiation. Not all the patients get relief from radiation, and the pain relief from radiation takes six weeks, whereas kypho, as I told you, it's in it's immediate. And so all of those things mean that we should be operating in an ecosystem where we work together as opposed to sort of fighting. And here at MUSC, since I've been here, because you know, I get along well with others and I, I you know, I, I talk to the radiation people all the time. That's exactly how we operate. My biggest referring service is the guys who are competing with me for the patients. So I get most of my sacroplasties and most of my kyphoplasties from radiation oncology. Palliative care and radiation oncology are the ones who are sending me all those. So, I mean, I get more outpatient referrals from radiation than I do from anybody else. And so... It, it's a complementary thing. And I think you have to think as multidisciplinary as you possibly can when you're talking about the cancer patients because there's no one size fits all. A, cholecystost a cholecystectomy is a cholecystectomy, but cancer patients aren't like that. They're so complex that you have to take advantage of everything you can and sort of decide in an individual situation which one is the right one to do. And I'll tell you, there have been times in, in tumor board where they're like, hey, we want to send this person for kypho. I'm like, yeah, I really think you should maybe think about radiation instead because I think that's a better one for radiation. And that happens all the time. And they do the same thing. They're like, yeah, maybe kypho instead of radiation for this one. Because they recognize that if the bone is completely replaced with tumor and they cook the tumor, then there's nothing left there to keep the bone from collapsing. Because that's the big difference between what I do and what they do. Two differences. One, I can get a biopsy. So if you need new biopsies of the tumor, I'm going to get a biopsy they're not. And two, I can actually provide mechanical stability by injecting that cement. And so that's kind of the difference between us and them in terms of, and they, um, contrary to what I just said, they can treat the whole spine at the same time, but it's kind of a one and done thing, right? So if they treat the whole spine with radiation and then the patient develops a new spine met, that they're done, right? They, there's limits to how much radiation they can give. And so we're very cooperative in these rays. Same thing with um, lung lesions. Like when you're talking about ablation of lung cancer, you know, the standard of care is SBRT for inoperable lung cancer, right? But what happens when they recur and the patient's already at 50 gray lifetime to their lung? What are you gonna do then? You just like, see ya, have a nice life? No, I can still do a cryoablation of that lung lesion very safely, and I can get them a response to their cancer without having to, to just like boot them out and tell them, you know, get your affairs in order. And so I think you'll always do better if you approach IR, especially if that's what you decide to go into. Obviously, some of you are still deciding, but um, if you approach it in terms of there are ways that we can work together and there are ways that I can be helpful to other doctors and that other doctors can be helpful to me. Your patients will do better and you'll do better. I mean, again, I am ne I'm booked out until mid-May. I don't have any spots on my schedule until mid-May. I have every single clinical spot booked and they're even admitting some patients to the hospital so I can do them sort of on call because that's the only way I can get people on my schedule. If you do a good job and you actually work well with others, you're not going to have any trouble recruiting, especially as an interventionist, because there's a lot of stuff you can do that other people can't. And so you're not going to have any trouble finding patients. That's not going to be an issue. It's just whether you're willing to, to do the work for these kinds of patients. And I'd say if you're interested in complex patients, 
this is a really good area to be. To be honest, the whole reason I became an interventionalist was because I didn't like simple patients. I didn't like pediatrics was like torture for me. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I wanted to kill myself, stab myself in the eye because they're like, okay, there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with you. I like complex problems. And so this is this is an area that's a very complex problem that's actually the most complex among IR, which is already the specialty where everybody else is like, well, we can't do anything for them. Why don't you call IR, see if they can do anything? That's our normal place in the whole system. Patients who are too sick or too complicated for other people, that's who we get. And so this is just another example of that. And again, you have you have skills and you have a, and you have uh, devices that they can't replicate. And so it's very easy to build a practice in this area, even in an, uh, in an ecosystem where it's already well developed. I mean, I've been here three years and my schedule is 60 percent pain at this point. And there was no pain in IR before I got here. Zero, absolutely zero. The entire institution was doing six kyphoplasties a year. I do 150 ablation kyphoplasties a year myself. You know what I mean? A pain pump had never been done in IR. I do 65 a year now. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's it's an area that's really easy to build as long as you're willing to, to train yourself to, to get good at it and think of patients and think of how you fit with other specialties. Don't just assume that you're always the best thing for everything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and that, and that kind of leads me to my second question, um, and then I'll give the floor to, um, to anyone else. Um, and that's kind of like, uh, you mentioned palliation as, as a major branch, um, especially in those patients whose you know, disease process, albeit in this case, we can say cancer or any other sort of um, oncologic issues going on. Um, and so your, your main idea is just palliation. What do you, how do you feel this expanding into like patients such as hospice um, who are terminal, who um, in most cases at the very end can be snow just under, like you said, tons and tons of um, pain medication, like opioids and stuff. Um, do you guys see yourself becoming first line therapy for those who are um, deemed, um, you know, to, to be in hospice care? Yes. I mean, I already am. So again, the hospice people call me constantly. One of these terminal cancer patients comes into the hospital with intractable pain that won't let them get out of the hospital. They call me and say, hey, what can you do to help me get this patient home? So, I mean, I'm, I talk to palliative care every day. I've talked to them four times today already, to be honest with you. So um, it's, it, it's an issue that you just need to be receptive and you need to be communicative because most people don't know what we can do. We can do crazy things that other people don't realize. And they look at the pictures, they're like, oh my God, how did you do that? Do you know what I mean? Like there are things we do that are just amazing to everybody else, but it's not that hard. You just have to know what to look for and what to do. And again, this is an easy, easy place to build a practice. Any monkey could do it. Do you know what I mean? Dr. Johnson, what kind of goes into like your decision making for doing vertebra versus kyphoplasty? Like, why would you like, I feel like obviously the indication for like ablation um, uh, kyphoplasty is pretty apparent. Like if there's obviously like a met or in there that uh, or a met or a tumor in there that's expanding and growing and causing fractures and things like that. But like if it's just a bland fracture, what leads you to be like, OK, I want to pump a balloon in there to like restore some of the vertebral structure versus I'm just going to pump concrete in there with like a vertebroplasty? So the only reason I would do a vertebroplasty is where I'm scared that I'll fracture the spine by opening up a balloon. So like somebody with ankylosing spondylitis that fractures their spine, if I open up a balloon, I could potentially get a posterior column fracture and I could paralyze the patient. But in every other circumstance, I wanna do kypho, not vertebro, and for a couple of reasons. One, the uh, there's less cement extrav with um, kyphoplasty relative to vertebroplasty. And that study that I showed you that showed the survival benefit, they actually included vertebroplasty in that study. And it turns out the number needed to treat to save a life with kyphoplasty was 14.8. It's 21.6 for vertebroplasty. And so vertebroplasty is not as good. You don't restore height as well. You don't get as much cement in. 
which is what correlates best with pain relief. And so by and large, I only do vertebroplasty if I'm scared to blow up a balloon or if I'm in the sacrum. Sacroplasty, I don't tend to use balloons because I'm worried that I'll bust a hole and you know get cement into the, the nerve roots. And I'm sure I have a feeling that the answer to this is yes, but just to be clear, do you also do ablation kyphoplasties within the sacrum? Yes. Okay. I, I thought that's what I thought. I distinctly remember there was this patient when I was on medicine. He had a lot of like prostate meds to his sacrum, and like kind of like you said, like I think he was like on a PCA. He was like in pain all the time. Then they sent him to probably you, and yep. you did a kyphoplasty, and he came back and me like it was crazy the the like it was night and day difference between post op. It was wild. Yeah, so he's a really good example. I know exactly the patient you're talking about. Um, he's a really good example of that inflammation of cancer thing that I'm, I was telling you. So that guy had an inferior pubic ramus, ramus met that was causing terrible, terrible sciatica because the sciatic nerve is right behind the inferior pubic ramus and the inferior pubic ramus was full of cancer. And so I went into the inferior pubic ramus, I cooked the tumor and then I filled it with cement and that got rid of the inflammation because there was no tumor there anymore. And then it was no longer irritating his sciatic nerve, and so his pain went away. Um, he might have also had some visceral pain in the pelvis related to that, but yeah, no, he got remarkably better. Um, and then one of my more my one of my final questions, I, I can kind of understand, I guess, like the ecosystem or providers for obviously like a, a pain due to cancer. I feel like obviously like oncologists, radiation oncologists, things like that are involved. But do you have other teams involved with you that are just more for like bland chronic back pain? Like whenever you do like a pain pump or you know you're doing constant or like even like if it's like a chronic a pelvic pain, do you have other teams involved that's handling it? Like do you have psych or OBGYN or any other team? that are involved with you or do you handle this as kind of the main point of care and you don't need much involvement from other teams so it depends to be honest with you some of them i handle in conjunction with other people i almost always for a chronic pain player i want to send them to psych i almost always do because you know cognitive behavioral therapy can be super helpful for those people if they're willing to engage and then many of the like for instance, there's a pain practice called Trident Pain run by a pain, a pain medicine doctor. He's an anesthesia pain doctor named Dr. Nolan. And he actually sends all of his patients that he manages himself to me to get their pain pump placed. So I just put in the pain pumps and then he manages them as an outpatient. And so I manage my own as well. But yes, there are these sort of cooperative things that go on. And like a lot of the uh, baclofen only intrathecal pain pumps are actually managed by neurology. And so the, the neurologist, the movement disorder neurologist who manages them sends them to me to get the pain pump. And then he does all of the management of the pump afterwards. And so, yes, there I, 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 I share these with a lot of people and there will be patients that I do kyphoplasty on and then new Mets develop and I call up radiation oncology. I'm like, hey, you got to help me out. This is not a good one for me. Can you please, uh, do you think you could help with this? Or for instance, I had a lady with trigeminal neuralgia who had terrible trigeminal neuralgia. A block helped, but it wasn't making her better. And she had a huge clival met, which I thought was actually impinging on the, tr the pain centers, which are at C1, C2, and then travel up the ponds for the trigeminal nerve. And so I thought that the inflammation of the tumor was actually causing problems because of that. And so I got Dr. Dr. Cooper from uh, radiation oncology to irradiate her clivus, which I'm obviously not gonna do anything to her clivus. There will be none of that um, in order to try to deal with the pain. And it actually improved her pain getting the clivus irradiated. And so, no, I, I'm all about doing everything I can to, you know, I get a patient who catastrophizes a ton. I will often send them to psych. Um, I'll coordinate with primary care physicians in terms of making sure that patients are on their antidepressants. I'll manage them myself if, they're, if their PCP is not doing it because putting people on antidepressants can be super helpful for pain. And then I coordinate with rheumatology and endocrinology for these bland back fractures. You know, if they've got if they've got a compression fracture, you need to treat their osteoporosis because otherwise they're going to get another one. I can fix the acute problem, but I'm not fixing the underlying problem, which is the osteoporosis. And so 
I will order a DEXA scan and then I'll get them set up with a doctor to treat their um, to treat their their osteoporosis. And I also probably am one of the two or three highest referring physicians in the institution for physical therapy. I send everybody for physical therapy because that can make a huge difference in recovery from some of these things, especially when you're talking about back pain. And so, uh, yes, no, I, I I recognize I'm in an ecosystem and they all know my name because I call them all the time. You know what I mean? And sometimes I'll treat a patient. I'll be like, I think this patient needs surgery. And so Calhorn is usually who I call. I like Calhorn a lot. I like Glazer too. If it's a patient who needs a really nice doctor, I'll send them to Glazer. But Calhorn, I think, is is my favorite of the neurosurgeons. And so, and he's a spine guy. So if I think somebody has trouble that I can't fix with nerve blocks and they need a laminectomy or something, then I'll send them to Calhorn to get them taken care of. And so, yeah, I you you have to understand you live in an ecosystem. And if you are you know, reasonable and always kind of thinking about what's best for the patient, not just what you want to do, then you will not fail because people will recognize when you take care, good care of patients and they'll, they'll appreciate it. And, you know, when I say to radiation oncology, I really think this patient needs a kyphoplasty. They trust me because they know that I have also at times said, no, this patient really needs radiation. They should not get a kyphoplasty. So the fact that I'm often arguing on their behalf means that they trust my opinion more. And so knowing that you're in the ecosystem and then being respectful of the other people, I think makes a huge difference in terms of how well you do over time. And, and I'll finish off with maybe a, a little bit more of an existential question, so answer it as you may. But I feel like kind of in this realm, especially chronic pain, I mean, I feel like oncology, you kind of have like a source and you can pinpoint it and you not kind of know what's causing it. But I guess you, what you would call more bland chronic pain. How do you kind of fight, for lack of a better word, like cynicism with dealing with some of these patients who are so complicated? They failed multiple therapies. A lot of providers don't necessarily want to touch them. Like how, how, how do you approach them and like stay positive and be optimistic with the care that you deliver? So um, uh, I think you have to adjust what you think about those kinds of patients. Um, when somebody comes to the ED with chronic pancreatitis, what do you call them? You call them a drug seeker. Okay, yes, that's true. They're there looking for pain medicine. But if somebody comes into the ED with pneumonia, aren't they also a drug seeker? Do you know what I mean? If you, I think if you actually look through the data and you look at this patient population a little bit more from a sort of rounded perspective of society, because you're right, there's a horrible, horrible association with the chronic pain players. People treat them like drug addicts all the time. And some of them come into you apologizing up front for having pain. And that's, that's terrible to me. That just makes me angry, actually. I feel like it's a population we've mistreated. So because of that, I have a tendency to sort of give them the benefit of the doubt. And then if you actually look at the data, these patients are better than most of your other patients in terms of their compliance with therapy. And so why are we mistreating people who are the most compliant patients in the hospital? If you look at, and again, I'm a medication assisted treatment um, certified physician, which means I can treat opioid addiction, okay? And the reason I got myself certified for that is because some of these these uh, cancer patients, you cure their cancer, their pain is gone, and they can't get off the opioids because they're physically dependent on them, and they can't get off of them because they can't. They keep withdrawing, and so it's like they keep taking them not because they want to, but because that's the only way that they can kind of get through their day because they're dependent on them now. So I became a medication-assisted treatment doctor because of that. And buprenorphine is actually an incredibly good drug to treat pain, to be perfectly honest. The thing I will tell you is nobody is more compliant than patients in medication assisted treatment programs. So if you look at patients who are on buprenorphine to stay off of heroin, they're more likely to be compliant with their drug regimen than people with hypertension are to take their blood pressure medicines. They're more compliant than people with diabetes are to take their insulin and watch their diet. And so really you're looking at a population that we all treat terrible because you can't see pain, right? When I can look at a diabetic's numbers and say, your blood sugar is 180, I need to do something about it. But when somebody says, I'm in pain, 
and they're difficult, your natural proclivity is not to necessarily believe them because you don't know what that means. And we've been conditioned in medicine to kind of look at everybody as a drug seeker because of this whole opioid epidemic. And so I think you just have to recalibrate and that's hard, right? That's hard. I'm not cynical. And I'll tell you, the patients can tell when they walk in the room and they you don't treat them like you're like they're somehow you're their you know, school teacher and you're there to punish them and put them in Saturday detention. When you don't treat them like that, sometimes you can actually get a better therapeutic response from them because if they like you, they'll do better. And most of them are willing to work with you. You know what I mean? And you'll find that you get incredible. And if you force yourself to avoid cynicism for your first 10 or 12 patients, eight of those 12, it'll be incredibly rewarding for you. For real, that's just what it'll be. Two or three will be incredibly frustrating and you'll have to deal with that. But for me, the amount that I'm able to help people like that diabetic who everybody told me was just a drug addict looking to get high all the time, when I put a pain pump in her, I gave her a PTM, which is a button that she can give herself extra doses. She never used it because she wasn't in pain anymore. And so it was really a pseudo addiction situation. And so when you hear the stories of a couple of these people, sit down with them and talk to them and say, how did this start? What have you been through? And you hear how hard some of these patients have had it and then how abusive the medical system is to them. For me, it's really hard not to have compassion and not to treat them like a person worthy of like treatment, of respect, of you being a doctor. And so it fits well into my personality because that's kind of how I am. I'm not a real judgy kind of guy, but you have to train yourself not to be cynical. And if you do, you'll be successful. And if you don't, you'll be like every other pain doctor in the world. Because a lot of people go into anesthesia pain because you make a ton of money. That's why they do it. They go into ortho because you make a ton of money. Ortho spine, you make a ton of money. And so, you know, if that's your motivation, you're not going to be the same kind of doctor that you could be if you're willing to deal with the complexity of a lot of these patients, deal with a lot of the issues that you can't fix, and also regard them as sort of individuals who are worthy of um, treatment and worthy of care. And that's the long-winded answer, but basically I think you have to train yourself not to be cynical, and once you've done it, um, it actually, it gets easier because you start to hear stories of how you've impacted people's lives. Even people who everybody else had written off and said was a terrible pe person, you realize, oh my God, they really weren't. It's just a whole society that has written them off and they've been suffering because nobody will take care of them. And so it's super sad to me, actually, it's super sad. All the time I'm taking care of a patient, they're like, well, I've had this problem for 20 years and nobody has helped me. And you're like, well, that is the worst thing that I've ever heard. And then you 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 treat them. And some of these patients who for 20 years have been the bane of every doctor who work with them existence because they're bothering them constantly, you get them stable on a pain pump and they come back once every three months and they're not causing anybody any trouble and they have quality of life. And so it can be really amazing. I have a pancreatitis patient who has been struggling with chronic pancreatitis for a couple of years, about two years now, can't work, struggling to get out of bed, constantly going to the ED for opioids, has biochemical evidence of pancreatitis every time her, her enzymes are up. We did a celiac block, she got a little bit of relief, actually did pretty well for a couple of weeks, got another episode of pancreatitis, back in the ED asking for pain meds, being yelled at by all the ED doctors who were like, I'm not giving you pain meds anymore. And it's like, well, you know I have pancreatitis, you know that really hurts. Why are you treating me like I'm a drug seeker? I ended up putting a pain pump in her and she's like working again. You know, for the last three months she's been working. She called to ask if she could go into a tanning bed with a pain pump because, you know, it has taken care of her pain and she's not calling doctors for meds all the time because it's taken care of, but she still can be alert and go to, her, you know, be in her life and it's amazing. It's amazing. And I'll tell you, I'm now getting referred every freaking chronic pancreatitis patient in the hospital because everybody knows that that happened. And so all the chronic pancreatitis patients are ending up in my clinic because some of them I can fix with a celiac block and the ones I can't, I can put a pain pump in and I can make them better. 
And that's really gratifying because these are patients that nobody is making better. You know what I mean? But I can make them better. I mean, they have to have an implant, which is kind of annoying, but at the same time, like you fix them. And it, it, it that is incredibly gratifying when somebody who's been struggling for, in many cases, 10 years, all of a sudden they can actually live their lives and not be constantly worried about where they're going to get their pain meds and if their doctor is going to retire and all that kind of stuff. Because it's it's incredibly um, like stressful for these patients when you look at what they actually have to do, because they can only get a month's worth of medicine at a time. They can't refill early. They have to be subject to constant urinalysis whenever they uh, go to their doctor. And um, they have to see their doctor at least once every three months. And so it becomes your life revolves around getting your pills when you're a chronic pain patient. And so it can be really incredible if you can do things to sort of rescue them in that way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I I appreciate that answer. And I, I think that, you know, your analogies with like hyper, anti-hypertensives and people who don't take them and things like that is, is a great point. And I just want to say I appreciate you lecturing on this topic because I personally, I feel like this is one of my deficits, I feel like, in IR is like kind of knowing all the interventions for pain. And so I feel like I've learned a lot from you over like the selectives and things like that because I came in not really knowing much about it. So I appreciate the lecture. It was it was awesome. Good. I'm glad to be helpful. Yeah, well, I think that's a good note. Um, if no one, Michael, um, Benjamin, if you guys have any questions, I think we're running a little over. Just feel free to email um, Dr. Johnson. And I think that uh, extends to anyone who watches this video after, um, once we post it to uh, YouTube, feel free to reach out to Dr. Johnson. Like he said, he posted his number uh, in the presentation about this topic. And I feel like uh, Nathan hit a good point. It's not a very well-known field. And so this is really exciting, really interesting stuff. And um, I just want to thank Dr. Johnson again uh, for you know speaking on this topic and kind of giving us uh, a nice walkthrough. Um, Dr. Johnson, any last words um, you'd like to pass on? Uh, no, I think smart people need to be engaged in this. And if any of you decide you want to learn how to do this, um, obviously I know how to teach it. So uh, um, it is an area that I think we need more doctors, but it, it requires people to actually choose to do this. And so I, I you know, uh, I will be super happy if if any of you decide that you think that this is important and that this is kind of what you want to do your life in. And um, I think that you won't be sorry if you do. I get a lot of I get a lot of satisfaction from my patients. Awesome. Well, thanks for everyone uh, tuning in and then uh, we'll be sure to upload the lecture shortly. Thanks. All right. Have a good night, guys. Thanks so much. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Johnson.